Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's session. Now, before we begin, a quick pointer for attendees. If you have any questions for our speaker, please send them to us using the Q&A function that you will see at the right side of your screen, the Q&A function. We will try to have audience questions answered towards the end of the session. So we're very happy to be speaking again to Shan Wei Jian, Chairman and CEO of PAG. PAG is a diversified alternative investment management company with more than $40 billion in assets under management across strategies that include private equity, real estate, and private credit. Now, our speaker, Mr. Shan, is an economist and the author of two recently published books, The Memoir Money Games and Out of the Gobi, which is a page turner on the buyout and transformation of what was once the largest bank in Korea, led by Shan while he was at Newbridge Capital. Newbridge Capital was later renamed TPG Asia. So our conversation this afternoon is about the art and science of making private equity investments in times of crisis. Mr. Shan, at our, at our summit um, in November last year, we talked about the investment environment in the midst of a pandemic. And you said that a crisis is as good a time as any to invest. So in fact, 2020 appeared to have been a particularly good year um, PAG invested close to $8 billion and realized some $5 billion. Perhaps you can now take us through how, you know, that performance was achieved, even as businesses and many other GPs were probably still coming to grips with the crisis. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. When it comes to investments, uh, we, uh, covered the entire Asia, uh, all the way from South Korea to in the north to Australia in the south, and then India on the west and Japan on the east and everything in between. And when you cover such large geographical area during a pan pandemic, when travel is very much restricted, uh, of course, it would handicap uh, many investors. But uh, I think we are lucky uh, by design that we have offices in all the major markets where we're active. You know, we have offices, obviously, in Beijing and Shanghai. We have offices in Tokyo, Seoul, Singapore, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Mumbai. Uh, so we have offices, we have presence in all the local markets. So our teams, even though it's almost impossible to travel across international borders without extended quarantines, our teams in the local markets remain very active. And that's why we're able to do deals in China, in Australia, in India, everywhere in Asia. If you don't have such a presence, to cover such a big market, I think it will be very much handicapped uh, during this pandemic. Right. But what about, um, you know, what are the long term implications of the pandemic for investors? You know, has it changed, I suppose, um, anything about the core thesis, um, core investment thesis? Well, investors will have to adapt to the market changes. Uh, not waiting for the market to change back to adapt the investors. So we will have to expect the worst, although we hope for the best. And the worst is that the lockdown, the travel restrictions will remain for some time to come. In fact, I have no idea when all the travel restrictions will be lifted. And therefore, we have to build up our local teams and we minimize the amount of travel uh, to do our business. But we have discovered, just like I'm doing right now, that it is possible to use technology to communicate in ways we never thought possible before the pandemic. So we can, we can now have video conferences uh, you know, with anybody, anywhere, with any crowd. So that has really made it possible to even negotiate big deals uh, without uh, meeting in person. For example, last month, 
we invested $2.8 billion into one company. And uh, you know, the negotiation took about uh, two months. And I left that particular transaction. Uh, <laughs> we negotiated through Zoom. Uh, I've never met with uh, the counterparty in person to this day. But uh, we closed the deal. We put in $2.8 billion into that particular transaction, all without the need to travel. Right. But um, just to understand, no, you focus on domestic and private consumption um, in Asia, particularly in China. Just wondering if the pandemic has changed anything around um, consumption habits, for example, and consequently, what impact does that have on um, investment thesis? Our strategies for different markets are different depending on macroeconomic conditions. Our belief is that uh, as an investor, it is very important to be able to underwrite macroeconomic risks before you even look at businesses. And if you've got the macro wrong, uh, you can lose money without regard to you know, how good the business is. You know, in the economic crisis, every business suffers. So macroeconomic conditions in different countries are different. Therefore, our strategies are also very different. For example, when it comes to China, for a very long time, China's growth has been driven by investments which have represented about 40 to 50% of GDP. No other country has invested so much at any time in history. But that growth model is changing and changing very quickly as the Chinese population ages, as the savings rate drops. So now China is shifting quite decisively in the direction of private consumption, which has grown as a percentage of GDP from 35% to 39% in the past five years. China's retail goods market, market uh, was about $1.8 trillion in value compared with the United States, $4 trillion in 2009. This was about 10 years ago. Today, China's retail goods market is about $6 trillion in value compared with $5.5 trillion for the United States. See, even though private consumption accounts for a very small percentage of GDP, 39%, compared with 68% for the United States, the absolute value of private consumption is growing very fast. And that's why in China, our strategy is to invest in businesses which cater to private consumption. But in India, our strategy is quite different because rupee remains rather weak, inflation rate is relatively high, and therefore it is more prudent to invest in businesses which do outsourcing. So they take hard currency as revenue and their input is in local currency. So you have natural hedge of currency risks. In China, we would stay away from s force because the currency has been appreciating and the labor cost has been appreciating at about 11% per year in the past 10 years. So the costs of input have been rising, whereas the prices of finished products have been rather flat. So your profit margin is squeezed every year for s force uh, oriented firms. And that's why we stay away from exports. Whereas in India, we would focus on export type of companies. So in different markets, we'll do it differently. Right. What about Southeast Asia then? Um, do you have a few opportunities here? Southeast Asia is very big on trade. Uh, Southeast Asia has become the largest trading partner of China, it used to be the United States, followed by the EU, but now Southeast East Asia has grown to be the largest trading partner of China. And of course, the economy is growing uh, quite fast in comparison with uh, more mature advanced markets. Uh, for us as a buyout firm, 
there are not too many very large scale companies in Southeast Asia, whereas in China and to a much lesser extent in India, whose economic size is just about 20% that of China, uh, you can buy very large scale firms. You know, as I mentioned, we put $2.8 billion into one deal uh, in China, and you would have to spend a lot of time searching for deals like this in Southeast Asia. So typically, the investments that we make in Southeast Asia are much smaller in size. Right. Would you be looking at sort of growth level um, investments? I mean, you recently closed your growth fund, your second growth fund that exceeded the target. Our growth fund is focused on China. I suppose we can do outside of China as well, but we don't really have the team outside of China to do growth. And therefore, we uh, focus on China. And China is also where the technology scene is. You know, there's so much venture capital activity, so many startup companies. And China offers offers the advantage of having very large scale. If you have successful business model, you can replicate it very quickly. With a population of 1.4 billion people, uh, the business can be very large, you know, such as Alibaba, Tencent, and so forth. And that's why our growth fund focuses mostly, almost exclusively on China. Right. So staying in China, just wanted to uh, get your point of view of what happening with um, you know the Chinese government's uh, tightening of regulations, the anti-monopoly action on the country's biggest businesses. You're an investor in Tencent, for example. You know, what do these um, actions, what implications do these actions have for you, for global investors? No, we are not investor in Tencent. We okay. invested in a company which used to be called China Music Corporation which operates a business very similar to Spotify. And then later, Tencent came in and made the investment. And still later, we merged that business with the QQ Music owned by Tencent. So we rebranded the merged entity as Tencent, Tencent Music Entertainment, TME. Uh, we already fully exited from that business uh, towards the end of last year and we made 20 times our return from that particular mm -hmm. investment. And that business grew very fast. And uh, you know, at the time of our exit, it had unique monthly subscribers uh, of 800 million. You know, only in China would you have this kind of scale. So it's, uh, uh, again, going back to what I said, China is where you can really scale up if a business model is successful. I think if you look at uh, the Chinese uh, regulatory actions in the recent months, especially, or since last year, starting with uh, the suspension of uh, the IPO for N Financial, uh, I think you can put them into different categories, all of which I suppose the policymakers have some social purposes in mind. I think the most important is to make sure that there's no systemic risk or to reduce systemic risk. And that has to do with, you know, crackdown on the shadow banking system. Remember 35 years ago, everybody was talking about shadow banking system in China. Now nobody talks about it anymore because it has largely disappeared, uh, especially P2P lending. There used to be tens of thousands of them. Now none exists to my knowledge. And, uh, the leverage of the uh, property sector, you know, forcing developers, property developers to reduce their leverage, requiring high capital ratios and lowering the interest seeding for consumer finance companies, which of course was the reason for the suspension of IPO for M Financial. So all of those measures have a social purpose of reducing societal debt and systemic risks 
in the Chinese system. You see the Chinese economy has been growing in the past 40 years without a recession. You know, China's economy is very much a market economy today. And the characteristic of market economy is from time to time, there is a recession. There are economic cycles, but China has not had a down cycle, a recession in the past 40 years. And I think that's because they have been able to reduce systemic risks before they become real risks. And other measures would include, as you mentioned, uh, to promote competition and to fight against monopolistic behavior uh, so Alibaba was fined, I think something like $2.8 billion or a greater amount for some behavior that's, that would be considered as uh, anti-competitive. And uh, I think the policymakers are also very focused on consumer rights, data privacy, and income inequality. So all these measures that we can go through each one of them, uh, you would find that there is a social purpose and you can't really argue with those purposes. I don't think that the policies are designed to suppress the private sector, nor to stifle economic growth, which of course will be self-defeating. I don't think that's, that's the purpose at all. Having said that, however, I think the government has tendency of overdoing it. They probably have more confidence in their abilities than the market. And as we know, actually, I don't think that uh, anybody or any government is smarter than the market. Regulations are necessary. If you do it excessively, if you overdo it, it can be harmful to the economy. So I'm a little worried in that regard. You know, some actions were taken too suddenly without pre-warning, without communication with uh, the market and without regard to the ramifications or the side effects to the capital markets. And I worry about those. Right, so all this um, injects a level of uncertainty then. I mean, how will it impact sort of decision making for the investors, you know, does it change anything fundamentally about China as an investment market? Well, for us, it's very simple. Uh, we have not been really affected by the policy changes, by the regulatory actions taken, but largely because we're very mindful of all these social issues. For example, we don't invest in gaming, we don't invest in smoking, we don't invest in gambling. We don't invest in anything which we think may have a social uh, issue. So, you know, ESG, environment, uh, social responsibility and governance is very big for investors, especially institutional private equity investors. And you have to keep in mind uh, all this social, environmental and governance issues. And to the extent you do that, uh, it's, I think unlikely that uh, you will get into trouble. Uh, I, you know, when we look back at what we did, we didn't know some of the actions, regulatory actions that will be taken. We did get out of consumer finance about three years ago because we saw the regulatory wind was changing. We saw the interest rate ceiling was being lowered. We saw the capital requirement was being increased. So we thought for some consumer finance companies, which really deal with subprime customers, you know, without a adequate interest rates, they would not be able to make money. So we exercised our put rights, we got out of consumer finance. And this was three years before N Financial was pulled from this IPO. Uh, N Financial at the time, uh, of course, was uh, not uh, required to uh, provide 30% capital and now everybody is required to provide. And, and therefore, I thought that uh, the, uh, the suspension of the IPO was actually prudent. You know, imagine that 
it went public, and then all of a sudden there's regulatory requirement of 30% uh, capital. So to the extent, I think if you focus, you're mindful of ESG issues, I think you can largely stay out of the problem. Right. But against this backdrop still, you know, what is your view on the tech enabled and tech related sectors? And um, do we expect to see sort of allocation towards other types, uh, other, other sectors in China? Infrastructure, um, renewables? There are different types of investors, uh, either in China or elsewhere. You know, we have venture capital firms, we have growth capital investors, we have buyout firms like what we are, and there are uh, investors who specialize in tech, in new economy type of firms, right? So if you look at China, I would say that for venture capital firms, they're hardly invest, uh, they're hardly affected by the regulatory changes, you know, especially early stage venture capital firms, because again, China is where the tech scene is. You know, there's a lot of startup activities over there. For growth capital, you know, with regard to our growth bonds, um, they are active as ever. And maybe valuation has become more reasonable. And uh, so I, I don't think they are very much impacted by the regulatory actions. For buyout firms, uh, I, I don't think there's any change. What really has changed? Uh, probably has to do with, uh, you know, technology uh, investors, you know, investors who specialize in new economy deals in technology companies, you know, this large uh, tech companies such as uh, Tencent, as you mentioned, and Alibaba, Meta, and so forth, and their valuation has corrected, of course, substantially. I think for these investors, you know, some of them may have to nurse their losses for some time. And some, if they're new in the market, uh, may see a good buying opportunity. And some who have invested not in the leaders in the market, but in competitors of the market, they're actually beneficiaries from the regulatory actions. So I think the tech investment scene is much more impacted by the regulatory actions uh, this year, uh, but not other types of investors. Right. Um, still in a related question, you know, until recently, there was a preference for Chinese firms um, to look for listings in the US. Mm. You know, in that sense, then, um, how much of that has changed or have secondary solutions evolved to sort of meet these um, liquidity needs in China? Yes, uh, you're right. Many Chinese firms did have preference for U.S. listing. And the reason is, it's not that the Hong Kong market is not big enough, deep enough. Uh, it is because it's much easier to get listed in the United States, you know, on New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. The reason is the system in the U.S. is very different from Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong is second most favored market for overseas listing for Chinese firms. The U.S. rules, uh, I would characterize them as disclosure based. You know, to the extent you disclose uh, what you do, all the risks, and then the regulators will let you go public. In Hong Kong, it will be sponsor responsibility based type of rules. And that is sponsors such as Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, all these large investment banks are held responsible for not disclosing enough risk of the applicant or the company uh, seeking listing or the problems of these companies. Their sponsors are legally responsible for frauds and problems. And therefore, the due diligence process for sponsors is exceedingly long. In Hong Kong, you have to engage a sponsor two months before you can file for public listing. In the US, there's no such requirement at all. 
And for some non-compliances in the terminology of the stock exchange here in Hong Kong, you have to rectify them before you qualify for listing in Hong Kong. Whereas in the United States, all you have to do is to disclose them. You don't have to comply uh, with certain rules. You know, if you look at DD, uh, the, the uh, ride hailing business, which uh, is currently in the penalty box uh, in the eyes of the regulators in China, I think in probably 80% of the localities where they operate, they don't have a license. Uh, they don't have a permit. Uh, in Hong Kong, they will not qualify for public listing, whereas in the US, all you have to do is to dis disclose such. And that's why it is so much easier to go public in the US, and that's why the US is preferred market. But the US is tightening from auditing and other types of scrutiny. And then there's, of course, political tension between China and the United States to such extent that there's a political risk that some companies may become delisted. You know, some state-owned companies such as China Mobile uh, were just delisted from New York Stock Exchange or other stock exchanges in the United States. Consequently, of course, Hong Kong becomes much more of safe harbor. And that's why even though Hong Kong is more difficult a venue to get listing, more firms have come to Hong Kong for public listing. I, I just read, I think this morning, that uh, Hong Kong IPO raised uh, something like $36 billion this year so far, and 96% of the listed new listed firms are China-based. So that shows the extent to which Hong Kong has become a more favorite venue for public listing by the Chinese firms. What about China itself then? You know, how are they going to attract listings? Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, for Shanghai Stock Exchange, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange is even more difficult to get listed. Uh, whereas, you know, in both US and Hong Kong, the uh, qualification is very much uh, uh, very much uh, in compliance with certain rules. But in China, is at the discretion of the regulators. So you know, the CSRC, that is China Securities Regulatory Commission, uh, can decide whether or not you qualify or not qualify. In Hong Kong, as long as you qualify by the rules, then the stock change cannot tell you that you don't qualify. You, know, you can actually sue uh, the regulators for not following the rules. In China, you certainly don't do that. So it's more difficult to get listed in uh, China, you know, sometimes the uh, regulators will say your PE ratio should not be more than, say, 20% uh, or 20 times, uh, or, or rules like that, right? That makes it uh, very hard for, for firms to uh, to get listed uh, in within China. Right. So on the flip side now, as um, you know, private equity dry powder is at another record level. I'm just wondering if we can expect private equity firms to look to the public market for deals, you know, as a buyout fund, you know, are we expecting more privatizations ahead? Privatization opportunities arise from time to time. But I don't think there's a pattern to it. If there's a pattern, you know, some companies may be oversold in the US market. And I understand that some companies would like to be taken private and maybe released in Hong Kong. And you hear cases like that from time to time. But I don't know that can be a pattern. So as a buyout firm, we look out for those opportunities. But that won't be our theme <laughs> because it's you know, opportunity is good to have. It's not something that you can count on. Right. So a couple more questions. Um, this one is, again, on the macro environment. You know, you had spoken briefly about your expectations of a Biden presidency the last time we, we met. You know, given all that you know now, what is your reading on the US-China relationship um, and its implications? 
point. I'm not it? optimistic with regard to U.S.-China relationship. In fact, I'm rather pessimistic. I think that uh, when President Trump started the trade war in 2018, there was a talk about decoupling uh, with China, which has not been successful. The trade war has not been successful. Uh, looking at U.S. trade deficit uh, with China, it has actually expanded. If you look at the numbers as analyzed by the New York Fed, as opposed to the Commerce Department statistics, because there's a lot of gray in the numbers, uh, which I will not get into at this particular point. But suffice it to say that the trade deficit has not uh, come down. And in fact, China exports to the United States uh, has been at a record high, especially in the past two years you know, during this pandemic. Uh, now, there was perhaps a political effort to decouple and to impose restrictions on tech technology exports to China. Today, I think that uh, there's probably more of an effort on the part of China to decouple, knowing that the, uh, the United States cannot be counted on for technology uh, imports, you know, whether it's semiconductors or other products. So China is making a great effort to invest in technologies and things that they think are bottlenecks in uh, the production process. So the political tension between the two countries uh, is not getting any better. Uh, so I would expect the relationship to remain quite bad in the foreseeable future. And maybe it will get even worse. But I think that the two economies are so much integrated at this particular point that in the foreseeable future, there's an effort to decouple, perhaps, to reduce the reliance on each other. But I don't think that uh, it will be meaningful. There will be meaningful decoupling of the two economies in the near future, in the foreseeable future, simply because the trade flow is so big uh, between the two countries, as well as the investments flow. Right. You so know, what is this natural investment? A company like General Motors to sell more cars in China than in the United States, a company like Apple, the stock of iPhone uh, handsets in China is three times as big as in the United States. So you know, how do these decouple uh, two economies if they're so, so much integrated with each other? Right. Um, we're running out of time. So just the last question. This is um, from somebody in the audience. You've said about doing a deal in India but it would seem that that country has turned hostile to Chinese investors. I mean, how, are, how do you see this play out? Well, first of all, I may look Chinese. But our firm is not Chinese, but we're based in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, our investors are mostly from uh, North America, from Europe, mm -hmm. from Middle East, and some other Asian countries from Australia and so forth. So we are not a Chinese firm. And I think for Chinese firms, there may be more scrutiny, more restriction. And secondly, we have had a presence in India for a long time. And we really uh, are very bullish on that market. It has its difficulties, of course, especially you know, in the lockdowns, the pandem pandemic, and so forth. But we think that long term, uh, the Indian economy offers a lot of potential, especially for private equity investors. Right. Well, thank you so much again for your time, uh, Mr. Shan, and um, hope to see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you very much.